Hello, greetings. Uh, this is Kaushik Desai. Yeah, Wendy, next slide, please. Hello, greetings, and welcome on behalf of Indian Industrial Pharmacy Section of FIP to this uh, most exciting webinar. First, before I move to next, uh, I have to apologize on behalf of Matthew because he is not able to join. I am Kaushik Desai. Who is assisting who was supposed to assist him but i'll be taking care of this webinar today so apologies from matthew next slide please uh, before we move on to the webinar uh, there are a few housekeeping rules uh, the webinar is being recorded and the live stream via youtube the recording will be available on our website www.events.fip.org and you can always ask questions using the question box provided please use the question box provided and not the chat box. You are also welcome to provide your feedback to webinars at the rate fip.org, which will help us to serve you much better in future. And also please note that we have a simultaneous uh, interpretation going on in three languages, Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese. You can select at the bottom of this channel, which channel you like to see at the bottom of the screen and the select the channel. So that's an added advantage to you to select the language. And also we always uh, welcome you to be a member of FIP and be active and contribute in our uh, all activities and endeavors. Next slide, please. Um, FIP would like to thank uh, BD, Dr. Dickinson for supporting this online event. Thank you BD for coming forward to support us. Next slide, please. Now I have a pleasant duty to perform to introduce our uh, guest speaker of today, Wendy D. Woodley. She is a staff scientist too for the Translational and Clinical Sciences Center of Excellence at BD Technologies and Innovation. That's more commonly known as BDTI. She is a published author and inventor with 22 years of research and development and product development expertise in the medical device industry with a focus on innovation in drug delivery devices and diagnostics. She has received multiple degrees, BS in microbiology, BS zoology, BA English and BA history. Really accomplishment from North Carolina State University. Her current work at BDTI focuses on drug delivery innovations with a concentration in preclinical model development, clinical testing, and translation of new ideas to product development. Now, I have a pleasure of presenting Wendy Dooley to you, Wendy Woodley. She'll be presenting on new clinical data on large volume subcutaneous injection tissue effects, pain, and acceptability in healthy adults. Wendy, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kashik, for that nice introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today's discussion. Um, I would just like to start out, uh, now that Kashik has introduced me to you, by also introducing you to where and with whom I work and the kind of work we do. So BD Technologies and Innovation, or BDTI, is a BD corporate R&D center located in the United States in Central North Carolina in the Research Triangle Park. The Translational and Clinical Sciences Center of Excellence team, whom you see pictured here, uh, is a multidisciplinary group with technical expertise that ranges from mechanical and bioengineering to core biology, pharmaceutical, analytical, and biochemistry, as well as clinical sciences. And we combine this broad array of expertise in applying a translational approach to assessing drug delivery concepts versus unmet medical needs. We begin that process by innovating preclinical methods and models to assess the concept and then perhaps transition both concept and model into early human clinical feasibility studies. The considerable evidence that is generated can obviously be used to de-risk product design, development or clinical outcomes, but it can also be used to support marketing, me messaging, and performance claims. Today, we're going to be discussing how we use just such an approach to assess large volume subcutaneous injection. 
So prior to the global pandemic, the pharmaceutical industry was already pursuing a increasing trend of providing self-injection and home care options in support of an aging world population and for the treatment of chronic diseases. The global pandemic merely served to underline the driving need for providing reliable and effective care options to patients outside the traditional clinical setting. The pipeline of biotherapeutics considering making this transition to subcutaneous administration is growing as biotherapeutics that have traditionally been administered intravenously in clinic are looking for alternative options. Subcutaneous administration is an attractive alternative as it conveys to both industry and patients alike a decrease in the cost time, and adverse systemic effects associated with their therapies. And for the patients themselves, it also increases the convenience and their autonomy around their therapies. But as these biotherapeutic formulations are either innovated for or adapted to subcutaneous administration, their dosing regime may have a change in or even an increase in its complexity such as viscosities higher than previously, or injection volumes that exceed the 1.5 to 3 mil boundary, where it was previously imagined that the tolerability and feasibility of subcutaneous administration ended. All of these different aspects of subcutaneous administration are important considerations when designing delivery systems that can enable the subcutaneous administration and in finding an ideal pairing of delivery system and biotherapeutic formulation. Now there are subcutaneous delivery systems available that can accommodate all of these various aspects of subcutaneous administration. And these range from pre-filled syringes to fixed dose injectors, such as auto injectors, on-body injectors, or wearable injectors. This is just a broad array of primary containers and subcutaneous delivery systems offered by BD. I wanted to show you this because the point here is there are so many options because there are so many different biotherapies, each with its own unique delivery profile and targeted deposition and release pattern desired. It is really important to assess all the aspects of the biotherapy as well as the delivery system combination to identify the ideal pairing. For the biotherapeutic formulation itself, you have to consider the volume, the viscosity, and the concentration of the formulation, but also the needs of the target population. All these various aspects of subcutaneous administration, from the increase in dosing complexity, questions around pairing a therapy with a delivery system, as well as the feasibility and tolerability of the injections themselves can easily be assessed by employing a translational approach. As I previously mentioned, a translational approach begins with the innovation of preclinical methods and models to assess the various aspects of the delivery system and biotherapeutic, and perhaps even optimize those aspects in cost-effective and iterative testing cycles. Now, these experimental testing cycles could be performed on a fully integrated and functional prototype design, or they may employ a surrogate delivery system, such as a programmable syringe pump. Programmable syringe pumps are highly adaptable and are agnostic of any particular platform. In fact, they can be programmed to simulate an injection by any of the delivery system options I previously named. And by using a programmable syringe pump and programming it to simulate injection with the various delivery systems in combination with delivery of formulations with those various volumes and viscosities, you can perhaps use this approach to help identify that ideal pairing of delivery system and biotherapeutic. 
in the early human clinical feasibility study we're discussing today, a programmable syringe pump has been used to simulate subcutaneous injection by a wearable injector. Finally, after all the evidence generation in those preclinical testing cycles is complete, you can perhaps transition both that method uh, and the concept itself into early human clinical feasibility studies where we're able to not only confirm those feasibility patterns, but increase our understanding of the administration because we have human subjects who can tell us how they perceived their injection experience and whether it was in fact tolerable and acceptable. In the early human clinical feasibility study we're discussing today, we used, as I mentioned, a programmable syringe pump that would be delivering six randomized injections to each of our subjects at a constant rate of 20 microliters per second. And this was accomplished through a commercial infusion set with a 29 gauge six millimeter cannula that was inserted manually perpendicular to skin. Each of the six injection conditions received by each subject are delineated in the table on the right of your slide. Subjects received four randomized injections to their abdomen, which was divided into four quadrants, a right and left upper and a right and left lower quadrant. Three of the abdominal injections were at a five mil volume with respective viscosities of one, eight or 20 centipoise. Each subject also received a 10 mil 20 cent poise injection to their abdomen. Our final two injections of the six were administered to the right or left upper thigh of each subject. They were both five mil volumes with a viscosity of one or 20 cent poise. Our placebo solutions here um, for the one cent poise placebo is a physiological saline that was also used to dilute a non-Newtonian hyaluronic acid solution to concentrations of 10 and 20%. When interrogated for viscosity at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and a shear rate of approximately 1,000, you get the corresponding viscosity of those placebos of 8 and 20 centipoise. All total, 192 injections were administered in this study, and for each injection, the inline in injection pressure was mapped versus time, and the location of the deposition confirmed using ultrasound imagery. Each injection site was assessed post-injection through two hours for tissue effects, and subjects rated their tolerability or pain, as well as answered acceptability questionnaires through two hours post-injection as well. Acceptability questionnaires were extended through 72 hours by performing follow-up daily phone interviews. To qualify for endpoint analysis, an injection had to have a confirmed delivered volume that was within plus or minus 20% of its target five or 10 mil delivered volume. And this was achieved in 91% of our injections. Our clinical subjects themselves were a population of 32 healthy adults, 50% of whom were female. The mean age of our subjects across the entire pool was around 32 years, and the mean BMI, 23.3 kilograms per meter squared. This is an overview of how we collected the endpoints I just named. Our inclusion criteria of delivered volume was calculated by performing a gravimetric comparison of the fluid path pre and post injection. And our depot locations qualified as being in the interdermal tissue, the target subcutaneous tissue, or the underlying intermuscular tissue, or even some combination thereof using ultrasound imagery. If tissue effects were observed at the site, such as wheel formation, it was measured in two dimensions, and those dimensions used to calculate the footprint of the wheel formation. 
Meal formation for the purposes of this study should be understood to be a visible rise in the skin surface at the injection site. Injection sites were also assessed for erythema or redness, um, bruising and bleeding. And again, these assessments were done immediately post injection when the device was removed and tissue effects were first visible, 30 minutes later, and then at one and two hours post injection. Our injection pressure was mapped versus time by incorporating a pressure transducer into our fluid path. And subjects helped us understand their tolerability or pain of their injection experience by giving us ratings uh, at different time points during the injection using a standard 100 millimeter visual analog scale. They also answered acceptability questionnaires using five point Likert responses. Injections that qualified for our analysis had depots that fell into three location categories. 98.1% of our depots were located fully within the target subcutaneous tissue or predominantly within the target subcutaneous tissue. We also had 1.8% of injections that had some infiltration or complete deposition into the underlying intramuscular tissue. And you can see the frequency or percent of occurrence of each of those categories for each of our six injection conditions in the graph on the right of your slide, where the y-axis is the frequency of occurrence and the x-axis are our six injection conditions. The first three columns are our five mil abdominal injections and moving from left to right, they increase through the one, eight and 20 centipoise viscosity. The fourth column from the left is our 10 mil 20 centipoise abdominal injection. And our final two columns on the right are our two five mil thigh injections with the farthest column to the right being that 20 centipoise viscosity. A fully localized subcutaneous depot is denoted in the graph by a deep blue color and a predominantly subcutaneous depot with some minor infiltration into the interdermal tissue above is in the lighter blue color. As we look across our six injection conditions, you will notice a pretty even distribution of that occurrence of minor interdermal infiltration across our six injection conditions although it may have been more common for our 10 mil 20 centipoise injection in the abdomen or our 20 centipoise 5 mil injection in the thigh. Those rare instances of intramuscular infiltration or deposition were only observed for our 1 centipoise 5 mil thigh injections and only in male subjects. Wheel formation, or again, that visible and measurable rise in the skin surface at the injection site above those depots was quite common and was observed in 90.9% .9 of our injection sites. You see the frequency of that observation in the graphs on the right, and I will draw your attention to the graph on the upper right of your slide, which is giving the frequency of occurrence for each of our injection conditions. Here, I'm going to spend a few minutes explaining the color scheme of the graph, because this is the same color scheme that will be used in all subsequent slides with results. And hopefully, a little explanation will make it easier for you to interpret the results. So an orange color denotes an abdominal injection, and a green color denotes a thigh injection. The intensity of the color increases as the volume or viscosity of the injection solution rises. So if we look at this top right slide, which is giving us the frequency of measurable wheels for each of our conditions, and you'll note there are four columns. These are our four time point assessments at zero hours or immediately after device removal, 30 minutes later, and then one and two hours later. Looking at that initial zero hour assessment, you will note the first four bars are orange. So those are our abdominal injections. 
And the first three bars, again, range from the lightest orange, which is one centipoise, to the darkest orange, which is that 10 mil 20 centipoise injection. Our final two bars are green. So those are our thigh injections with the darkest color being that 20 centipoise injection. And you'll notice if you look at that initial assessment, as I mentioned, wheel formation was quite common and nearly universal, occurring almost equivalently across our injection conditions. But as we track the pattern to the right, as we move through our time points, you'll notice that wheel formation was highly transient with resolution already underway within 30 minutes. But as you look at that pattern, you begin to notice some differences based on the volume or viscosity of the injection or even the site where the injection was administered. Here, I'll ask you to shift your attention to the graph in the lower right of your slide, where we have the same time points and the same color scheme. But what we're looking at here are those measurements of the entire footprint or spread of the wheel. Here, that pattern of difference related to volume, viscosity, or injection site is much more apparent. So even though we know from the graph on the top right of your slide that wheel formation was equally likely or nearly equally likely across our injection conditions, shifting your view to the bottom right shows you that the size or prominence of the wheel was not consistent. In fact, you'll note that 10 mil 20 centipoise abdominal injection and both thigh injections had larger wheel spread than the other injections, viscosity notwithstanding. And if you follow the pattern as you move to the right through the subsequent assessments, you'll note that wheel formation resolution was more rapid for lower volumes, viscosities, and any injection administered to the abdomen. Our other tissue effects, effects assessed were also transient, just as our wheel formation. Let's begin with erythema, or redness at the site, which was as likely as wheel formation and was observed in 92.6% of our injection sites immediately post-injection. Erythema was graded on an observational five-point scale that's described to you in the table on the bottom left of your slide. A grade of zero means there was no erythema at the site. A grade of one means the site was slightly pink or red. A grade of two means that the area of redness had a well-defined periphery. A grade of three means the redness was moderate, and a grade of four means that it was severe or intense. Though we did see erythema at 92.6% of our injection sites, it's worth noting that it was never more intense than grade one slight or grade two well-defined. And you can actually see that pattern of intensity in the graph that is on the right of your slide where the five-point scale I just described is the y-axis and the x-axis are our four time-point assessments immediately post-injection, 30 minutes, and one to two hours later. So looking at that initial assessment, you'll note that though we did have pretty minimal erythema intensity, there is some separation between our abdominal and thigh injection sites with the abdominal sites having slightly more intensity. However, you'll note, it, you'll note that it is extremely transient, having already begun across injection conditions by 30 minutes, and at one to two hours, has almost nearly universally resolved. It's also worth noting that while we do see some delineation between abdominal and thigh injection sites initially, within 30 minutes, there really is no separation between the intensity observed at any of our injection sites. Bleeding was also graded on an observational five-point scale, again described in the final column of the table on the bottom left of your slide. Here, grade zero is still no bleeding at all. Grade one would be a tinge of red, grade two, a drop of blood, grade three, an ooze of blood, and grade four would be significant bleeding. Like our erythema, 
our bleeding intensity was never more than grade one to two tinge or drop of blood. And this was only observed at 36.6% of our injection sites. And it resolved immediately at 96% or more of our sites prior to any subsequent assessments. Bruising was assessed only as yes or no and was quite rare. It was only observed at three sites overall, but only at one site per assessment, and only a single site had not completely resolved at that final two-hour assessment. Our inline injection pressure mapped during the injection is shown here for each injection condition in the graph on the right of your slide, where the y-axis is the pressure in PSI, and the x-axis is the time of injection. So here I'll remind you that our 5 mil injections were 4.1 minutes long and our 10 mil injections 8.2 minutes long. At the end of pump delivery, we left the device in situ for a period of equilibration within the fluid path and between the delivery system and the tissue. The pressure was mapped not only through pump delivery, but through that 10 minute interval of in situ dwell. And I want to reiterate here that at the end of that 10 minute in situ equilibration period, that is when the device was removed. So in the slides just previous and in subsequent slides, when you see zero hours, it should be understood to mean that that was the time of pump delivery plus a 10 minute equilibration period before the device was removed and the site first visible. On our graph here, each of our injection conditions has again that same color scheme where orange is an abdominal injection, green is a thigh injection, and an increase in the intensity of the color is an increase in the volume or viscosity of the injection. The solid line for each injection condition is the mean pressure at that particular time point. And the dotted line around that mean line is the 95% confidence interval around the mean at that particular time point. A couple of patterns are immediately apparent here. For instance, our maximum injection pressure as well as the area under the curve increased with our increases in volume and viscosity. But you'll also notice some striking similarities in our curves. Despite differences in area under the curve or maximum pressure, each curve has the same three signature phases. Phase one is a stark rise from baseline as the pump began delivery, which settles into a more gradual slope, almost like a plateau while the pump delivers. And then in phase three, which begins when pump delivery ends at either 4.1 or 8.2 minutes, you see a sharp fall off as the system returns to equilibration. It's worth pointing out here that these pressure profiles are unique to the fluid path and the drive mechanism employed here, as well as the characteristics of each formulation. I make this point because you can see first and foremost how informative this assessment is, but secondly, because it is unique to each delivery system, drive mechanism, and formulation, I can only recommend that this same assessment be performed for each considered drive delivery system and formulation combination. So we've discussed our injection pressure, we've discussed our tissue effects and our depot location. Let's now change our focus slightly and discuss how our subjects perceive their injection experience. We're going to start by discussing the tolerability pain scores our subjects gave for each injection they received at eight different time points. And I'll remind you that those assessments were made by rating their pain at the injection site at that time point on a 100 millimeter visual analog scale where zero millimeters indicates no pain and 100 millimeters indicates the worst pain the subject could imagine. 
in the graph on the right of your slide, that 100 millimeter visual analog scale is our y-axis. Our x-axis in each panel are our six injection conditions, where again, orange is our abdominal injections, green are thigh injections, and the increase in color intensity indicates an increase in viscosity and or volume of the injection. You will note eight different boxes denoting eight different time points assessments for each injection site. And those began when the site was naive, so before anything had been done. The second assessment was immediately after manual insertion of the cannula, and then an assessment during the injection and immediately after the end of the injection, so at 4.1 or 8.2 minutes. The zero hour time point is after that 10 minute equilibration period. So 10 minutes after the pump stop delivery and at device removal. And then the subsequent assessments at 30 minutes, one to two hours. So as we look at this graph, there are several patterns that are immediately obvious. For instance, across all our injection conditions, the perceived pain at the injection of the injection peaked during the injection, but was highly transient having already begun to resolve somewhat at the end of pump delivery, and 10 minutes later at the removal of the device had almost universally dissipated. And interestingly, all levels were below those indicated at the manual insertion of the cannula. You'll also note if we focus on the peak pain during injection, that there's a broad distribution of those scores for each injection condition. And that's just because of the inherent variability of how the subjects perceived their experience. Because of that broad distribution, when we compare our injection conditions to each other at each time point, we aren't actually able to discern any statistically significant differences between our injection conditions nor can we find any correlation with the injection pressure and the tissue effects previously discussed. However, if we look at the patterns of our pain scores, we do begin to see some interesting trends. For instance, and again, I'm focusing here on those peak pain scores during the injection. Let's look at our first three columns, which are our five mil abdominal injections and running from left to right are one, eight and 20 centipoise. You will note that perceived pain during the injection decreased as the viscosity increased. And that's one possible interpretation, but it's also worth remembering that there are differences in each formulation. That first bar in light orange is 100% saline. The second eight centipoise injection is 90% saline. And the third bar is 80% saline. So while it may be that this decrease in perceived pain was due to the viscosity, it is also likely that it may have been due to the formulation or some combination thereof. When we look at our third and fourth bar, and these are our 220 centipoise abdominal injections, the third at five mils, the fourth at 10 mils, you'll see that doubling the volume administered did increase the perceived pain of the injection. But interestingly, when we compare that 10 mil 20 centipoise injection in fourth bar to our five mil one centipoise abdominal injection in the first bar, the five mil Centipoy, one centipoy saline injection still appears to have been perceived as more painful. Also, if we compare the comparable one and 25 mil centipoise injections administered to the abdomen with our two five mil one and 20 centipoise injections to the thigh in green, you'll also note that thigh injections were perceived as being less painful. And again, we also see that pain for those thigh injections was less at the higher viscosity or the lower concentration of saline. It's worth reminding you at this point that these were all placebo formulations. And even so, we do see some differences based on the composition or the characteristics of those formulations. 
again, this assessment is quite interesting, but probably should be repeated for different formulations and their various characteristics and, and contents. While we do notice that thigh injections were perceived as being less painful than abdominal injections, it's also worth noting that we asked each subject if they had a preference at the end of, of all injections, if they had a preference between their abdominal and their thigh injection sites. And I'm happy to report that 64.5% of our subjects had no preference between the sites, which tells us that despite the indicated trends that we see, both sites were equally viable. But if subjects did express a preference, unsurprisingly, it was for the thigh. Subjects also answered acceptability questionnaires, you know, using those five point Likert responses. And they answered those questionnaires at the zero hour time point first. So when the device was removed and the tissue effects first available. And then they answered them again at 30 minutes, one and two hours. And then we followed up with phone interviews at 24, 48 and 72 hours. Our questions at, that you see in the graph on the right of your slide were questions about sensation at the site, such as I feel no pain, I feel no itching, I feel no pressure, and about the acceptability of the appearance of the site, because I remind you these were answered when the tissue effects were visible. So we asked if the appearance was acceptable. Subjects responded with those Likert category responses as I strongly disagree, disagree, I'm neutral about the question, I agree, or I strongly agree. What the graph is showing you here per question is the percent agreeable responses and the device is first removed. So when we ask the subjects, I feel no pain, and they say they agree or strongly agree, they're agreeing their side is not painful, or they're agreeing that the appearance is acceptable. And happily, you will note the broad and high percentage of ex agreeable, acceptable responses to all questions. In fact, 82.8% .8 or more of responses per injection condition indicated that the appearance of the injection site was acceptable. And again, this is when those tissue effects were first revealed. Also, at that same time point, 86.2% or more of our subjects per injection condition indicated they felt no pain. 96.6% or more had no itching at the site, and 79.3% or more felt no pressure at the site. So finally, our findings indicate that five and 10 mil injections at one to 20 centipoise administered to the abdomen and thigh of our healthy adult subjects were not only feasible, but that subjects found their transient tissue effects and injection pain broadly acceptable. But that doesn't mean we didn't discern any interesting differences. For instance, we know that the formation and resolution of our tissue effects is less prominent and resolution more rapid at lower volumes, viscosities, and for injections administered to the abdomen. Also, interestingly, when we compare those tissue effects and the inline injection pressure to our subject tolerability pain scores, we don't find any correlation between them. So finally, what this suggests is that the boundary conditions of large volume subcutaneous injection feasibility and tolerability most certainly exceeds that traditional 1.5 to 3 mil boundary, but also likely exceeds the conditions that we tested here. And so I can only end by recommending that similar assessments be continued. This is an emerging industry with very little published data 
around the variable injection conditions possible across all biotherapies. So additional studies for various formulations, volume, viscosity, and across a broader subject demographic can only serve to evolve our understanding of what is feasible and tolerable for subcutaneous biotherapeutics, and also help inform and optimize delivery system design to be paired with those biotherapeutics. So I thank you so much for your attention. I thank all my co-authors for their considerable contributions. And I also thank all the individuals listed on this slide for their contributions. Finally, I look forward to your questions. Yes, thank you, Wendy. I think uh, we have been awaiting a uh, question answer. All the participants, I request you all to pose your questions in this Q&A box. In fact, we have been getting excellent feedback in the chat box, Wendy. They're okay. saying great session. And I think uh, we'll wait for a minute or two for people to ask questions. Otherwise, there are none so far. <laughs> Except for the good positive uh, feedback. Well, thank you so much for the positive feedback. Perhaps the absence of question means I was thorough. No, that also means that, uh, that you explained the subject so well that there are any questions. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, even if you can't think of your questions now, please don't hesitate. You can just use my name to find um, the complimentary publication of this study or uh, other work by searching my name in PubMed. And you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn as well if you can't think of your question now. I'm happy to follow up at any point. Thank you, Wendy, for your assistance. Of course, uh, our participants will uh, definitely make use of this, uh, your uh, suggestions and offer. Thank you. Okay, can we conclude? Can we go to the next slide, please? I have very important announcements to make before we sign off. This year, the FIP Pharmacy Practice Research Special Interest Group Summer Meeting will be held in person on 4th and 5th of July, 2022 at Utrecht, Netherlands. The poster is in front of you. All PhD students and their supervisors, researchers, academics, professional organizations, and practitioners involved in research are welcome to join this meeting to build a global pharmacy network, present their research by submitting an abstract, and increase pharmacy practice contributions to global health. This program will offer interactive workshops and keynote sessions, networking events, and interactive closing panel discussions. So kindly make best use of this uh, opportunity. Next slide, please. There's uh, another very, Wendy, can I go to next slide, please? Yeah. So we are really excited to invite you to the 80th FIP World Congress of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences in Seville, Spain. This has been happening almost after two years. There's a first physical event which is happening by FIP, which has been getting postponed. The Congress will take place from 18th to 22nd September 2022 under the theme Pharmacy United in the Recovering of Healthcare. Registration and abstract submissions are already open. For more information, kindly check our website, Seville, that is -E -E S-E-V-I-L-L-E 2022-2022.fip.org, which is already appearing in front of you in the slide. Or you can always scan through our FIP website and get more details. So we welcome you and would like forward to see most of you at our this physical event, which is happening at Spain from 18th to 22nd September. Thank you. And can we go to next slide, please? This is uh, the program uh, topics, just uh, in uh, broadly. It will touch upon never waste crisis, learning for future preparedness. So one topic will be science and evidence supporting the response to COVID-19. And third will be dealing with new and extraordinary ethical challenges. Kindly note the important dates. Abstract submission, 5th June, this abstract, Acceptance will be announced by 1st July 
and early bird registration deadline is 15 July 2022. Kindly make best use of this opportunity. And we look forward to see most of you at this event, which we have missed you from last two years. Uh, you can always check all of our future digital events because we have been conducting digital events by various of our sections through events.fip.org. Practically every two weeks, once in two weeks, there is something happening. Kindly take part some of a subject of your interest and also spread this uh, information to your networking professionals. Thank you. Next slide, please. So Wendy, you have been excellent uh, presenter and you made the subject, this so complicated subject so simple that there are hardly any questions left. But participants, as Wendy has suggested, you can always pose your questions to Wendy, maybe in the future too, and she'll be there to help you out. Wendy, you made this large volume subcutaneous injection tissue effects with examples and the outcome of each experiment very simplified and easy to understand. It has been beneficial to all our participants and we look forward for BD support and the, another subject of interest in future too. Thank you very much. And with this, we end our webinar and I thank all the participants, FIP digital team and Matthew, my moderator, to give me opportunity to conduct this webinar. And thank you once and all. Thank you. We end our webinar now.